A few months ago, I built myself an on-air sign to hang in my home office to let my family know when pants are required to enter the room. The sign turned out nice and looks great on my wall. I can even control it via my Amazon Echo or with my phone, but I never achieved my goal of having the sign automatically turn on when I start a virtual meeting. That is until now. Welcome to Maker at Play Coding. If you're new here, I'm Michael and I enjoy making things and sharing them with you. My passion is programming, but I also enjoy woodworking and electronics. This channel is dedicated to my programming videos. Check out my other channels dedicated to woodworking and maker projects. You can find links below. I would love to have you as part of the Maker or Play community. When I first built my on-air sign, I knew I needed to automate it. If I didn't, I figured I'd forget it turned on most of the time, and I was right. My plan was to figure out a way to detect when my webcam was on, but as much as I tried, I could not come up with a way to do it via software. At least not one that would work when another application like Zoom was controlling the camera. Then I thought about using a hardware solution, such as adding a light sensor to the camera to detect when its LED turned on, but I wasn't excited about going that route. So I gave up on it, until one day a new idea popped into my head. What if I could just sniff the network for Zoom traffic and use that to automate my on-air sign? And after a couple quick Google searches for some sample code to sniff the network traffic, I had a working proof of concept that looked very promising. I then spent a couple days monitoring network traffic during my virtual meetings and figured out it was fairly simple pattern to detect when I was in a Zoom, WebEx, or Microsoft Teams meeting. Let's walk through the code so you can see exactly how easy this solution turned out. I like to follow the single responsibility principle when I write code. I'm sure there might be some purists that can argue that I didn't fully achieve it in this project, but I think it's close enough for what this small project deserves. So chill out, Karen. As I saw it, this program could be broken down into five main objects. The forms class, which is responsible for all user interaction. The network class, with its supporting IP header class, which is responsible for listening for data on the network and parsing that data. The virtual meeting class, which is responsible for determining if a meeting has started or ended based on the network data. And finally, the on-air class, which is responsible for knowing how to turn the sign on and off. I also like to write my code to have loose coupling between my classes. For this project, I do that by using the observer pattern. Both the network class and virtual meeting class define delegates to allow other classes to observe their state changes. It starts the network. We know that when we are using VoIP and video on our computer, it will be over UDP, not TCP. We also know the UDP traffic will be going between our computer and the servers hosting these meetings, which are outside of our network. Therefore, the first logical step for my program was to create a class with the responsibility to listen for this traffic. I create a raw socket and configure it to receive all IP traffic and set up an async callback to handle each IP packet the socket receives. In the callback function, we will complete the pending asynchronous read and then call our parse data function to see what we got. We instantiate our IP header class so that it can parse the raw data into usable information for us. Let's talk about what an IP header looks like. An IP version 4 header consists of a minimum of 20 bytes and a maximum of 60 bytes. For our use case, we only ever care about the first 20 bytes, so those are the only ones I define in the IP header class. We use a memory stream and a binary reader to parse the raw byte array into the individual fields or properties of the class. Of all these properties, we only care about protocol, source IP address, and destination IP address. Now that we have the IP header parsed, we can inspect the protocol as well as the source and destination IP address to see if this is an IP packet we care about. And if it is, we will invoke our delegates to let the rest of the program know about this packet. We are only interested in UDP network packets that are going out or coming into our network. We first check to see that this IP header is in fact UDP. And if it is, we will also make sure it is not multicast or broadcast traffic. Next, we check the source and destination IP to make sure it is an IP packet for our computer. And finally, we check that either the source or destination IP address is not an address on our network by doing this quick hack of a string compare of the first three octets. If it passes all these checks, then we assume that this is UDP traffic from a virtual meeting. So we will fire an event to let the rest of the program know about this packet. And that completes the responsibility of the network and IP header classes. Once the network class fires its load, the forms... <laughs> I forgot about that. That's funny. <laughs> Once the network class fires its load, the forms class handles that event and simply passes the data to the virtual meeting class. By using events in this way, we keep from coupling our network class and virtual meeting class. Otherwise, the network class would have needed a reference to the virtual meeting class to pass it the data. The virtual meeting class has the responsibility to determine when a virtual meeting has started or ended. And the logic I came up with to figure this out was to base it on how many UDP packets we see per second. When I first started this program, I thought there would be a lot of UDP traffic on my network 
and not all of it was related to virtual meetings. Therefore, my idea was to figure out a threshold the UDP traffic needed to cross to consider it to be from a virtual meeting. I thought the UDP traffic would drastically increase when I started streaming my video for the meeting. What I learned though was that after I filtered out multicast and broadcast traffic, and then also filtered out UDP traffic that stayed within my own network, it left only UDP traffic generated by virtual meetings. This allowed me to drop my packet threshold down to one, much lower than the 100 I started out with. The virtual meeting class keeps a running count of UDP packets received. It also keeps a count of inbound versus outbound packets just for the purpose of showing this in the UI for interest. The check meeting status method gets called every second by a timer and it executes the logic to determine if a meeting has started or ended. First, it checks if UDP packet count has met the threshold. If yes, next it checks to see if we are already in a meeting. If not, then this indicates a meeting just started, so it updates its state and invokes the on meeting started event to let the rest of the program know. If UDP packet count for the last second has not met the threshold, we are going to increment our second count variable in order to keep track of how many seconds it has been since the threshold was met. If we are currently in a meeting and the number of seconds since the threshold was met is greater than our seconds threshold, then we update our state to indicate we are no longer in a meeting and invoke the on meeting ended event. Through observation, I have seen at the beginning of virtual meetings, there could be a few seconds of UDP traffic followed by a few seconds of no UDP traffic as the meeting gets connected. Therefore, I added the logic that at least X seconds of not meeting the UDP count threshold needed to pass before assuming the meeting has ended. After getting this working, I thought it would be a nice touch to not only show when a meeting started, but to say what type of meeting it is. For my day job, I heavily use Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and WebEx throughout the day. To figure out which application is being used for the virtual meetings, I do a simple hack of just checking the first two octics of the remote IP address against a list of IPs I created for each application. So far, I've been lucky and the first two octics of the server IPs don't overlap between Zoom, WebEx, or Teams. And by just comparing the first two octics, it allows me to cast a wider net and increase the odds of any given IP address for a meeting to match my list of IPs for each application. I got these lists of server IPs from the support pages of each of the vendors, and occasionally when on a meeting, I see a new IP and I just add it to my list. You should not expect that these IP lists are static as these companies will continue to change their IPs over time. It might even be a good idea to change the source code to read these IPs from a config file so you don't have to recompile the application to update the list. Now that we have events that tell us when a virtual meeting starts and ends, let's do something. You can do it! The obvious thing to do is update the UI of the form, which we do by changing some text fields to show timestamps of when the current meeting started and ended, along with its IP address and meeting type. I also change the form color and update the icon and assist tray. But the more exciting thing to do when this event fires, and the whole reason I wrote this program to begin with, is to turn on and off my on-air sign. I created an on-air sign class to handle this responsibility. This class exposes two methods that makes the API calls to turn on or off the sign. The sign contains RGB LEDs, so when we turn it on, we can control exactly what color we want it to be. And for no practical reason other than I can and it's cool, I turn on the sign with a different color for each meeting type. I chose blue for Microsoft Teams, green for WebEx, and red for Zoom. You will find a link down below to my GitHub repo for this source code. I hope you find it useful for one of your own projects. I'd love to hear about that project, so leave a comment down below or tag me in a tweet or Instagram post. And here's a link to the video where I show how I built my on-air sign. Go check it out.